on this Saturday night, the battle for Kyiv. Fierce fighting around the capital. The explosions are in every district of Kiev. It's like a nightmare. Ukrainians dig deep to defend their country and plead for the world to help. You need to act now to stop Russian aggression. Global condemnation. We hate what's just happening right now in our country. Stepping up the pressure on Vladimir Putin to end the invasion. Also tonight, lifting restrictions. We can say with confidence that the numbers continue to decline rapidly. Alberta moves closer to post-pandemic life. And climate diplomacy, the push for an international treaty to fight plastic pollution. Global National, reporting tonight, Soapy Louie. Explosions lighting up the night sky around Kyiv tonight as the Russian military makes a push to close in on the Ukrainian capital. Ukraine's military and civilian volunteers have so far managed to hold off the Russian advancement. But as darkness has fallen, the assault has escalated. Tonight, terrified men, women and children sheltered inside and underground in Kyiv. Many are taking refuge in the city's subway stations. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians have already fled the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in a new video earlier today maintaining his resolve and his position in Kyiv. Good evening and thanks for joining us. European leaders along with Canada and the U.S. are now stepping up economic pressure and blocking selected Russian banks from accessing the SWIFT financial messaging system, which facilitates cross-border payments. That's in response to Russia's ongoing assault on Ukraine. The Ukrainian government says at least 200 people have been killed on its soil. More than 1,500 civilians have been hurt including 34 children. Our Crystal Gomancing is in Poland tonight, about an hour's drive from the Ukrainian border, and joins us now. Crystal. Sophie, Ukraine's president, wants peace. As members of his team told me, he wants it through negotiations, not death. Vladimir Zelensky says he is willing to engage with Vladimir Putin, even on the issue of Ukraine's neutrality. But he is not willing to bow to any Kremlin ultimatums. From night to day, at all hours, the sounds of war echo through the streets of Kiev. It's like a nightmare, but the most outrageous is that it isn't a nightmare, it isn't a dream. It's our reality. Olha Faiziva is in the capital when her husband and brother signed up to serve she moved in with her parents. There is a bomb shelter, a three-minute walk away, but it's full. So they sit in the dark together, waiting. No, we are not safe. It's impossible to be, you know, safe when you open the window and you can hear the explosions. No, okay, not near your house, your apartments, but you can hear them. You never know what uh, direction will be on the next time. Ukrainians are resisting the world's second most powerful army using every possible method. A video shared widely from Bakhmach in the country's north shows a man standing in front of a Russian tank. He then kneels down. An act of peaceful defiance that is being compared to a similar scene from Tiananmen Square in 1989. <laughs> Those who could make their way out of the country after Russia launched its full-scale invasion have fled to neighboring countries such as Moldova and Poland to seek shelter. We were taken by car and then we walked for a long time because it was impossible to go. We walked for almost half of the night to the border crossing point. The Polish government says the country has already taken in more than 100,000 people in the past 48 hours. Many more will come if the fighting continues. 
I do not know if it will be possible to see my relatives, my friends, or return to Ukraine. It is very difficult to talk about. And that is something we are hearing from so many people as they cross over into Poland and safe territory. They are desperately afraid about what happens to those they've left behind in Ukraine. They are also calling for the world to act and force Russia to end this war. Sophie? Crystal Gomancing in Poland. Crystal, thank you. Now, amid the siege on the Ukraine capital, an impassioned plea for help from Vladimir Klitschko, the brother of Kyiv's mayor, a former boxing heavyweight champion who enlisted in Ukraine's reserve army earlier this month. You need to act now to stop Russian aggression with anything you can have now in an hour or by tomorrow is going to be too late. Residents of Kyiv remain under a curfew as battles continue between Ukrainian and Russian forces. Joe Fetterman is a journalist with the Associated Press on the ground in Kyiv. I spoke with him earlier about the curfew and President Zelensky's defiance in the face of Russia's aggression. Kyiv's mayor extended that overnight curfew until Monday morning uh, in order to prevent residents from being mistaken for Russian saboteurs. What does he mean by saboteurs? Yes, they believe that uh, there are elements within Ukraine's own population who are sympathetic to the Russian cause. If you remember, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, it has a long history uh, with Russia. It has its own Russian-speaking uh, minority, um, and they believe that there are people within the population who are assisting uh, the Russian forces. So they are trying to use this time now. It's about 36 hours of complete closure uh, to track down. And what they say that some of these units actually disguise themselves. Themselves. They wear Ukrainian uh, uniforms and so forth. So they're using this coming period, 36 hours, to track down these uh, so-called uh, saboteurs. Mm -hmm. All right, President Zelensky has appeared in another video uh, to show that he remains in Kyiv despite the Russian advances. He also turned down a U.S. offer to evacuate. And according to Ukraine's embassy in London, Zelensky said, the fight is here, I need ammunition, not a ride. How long can President Zelensky hold out, do you think? Yeah, that's a question. Um, I can't give you an answer. I can't predict the future. What I can tell you is if you had asked me this yesterday, I would have given you a different answer. Yesterday, it felt like the Russian army was just closing in on the city, and it was a matter of time before everything collapsed. Today, it feels like the tide has turned a bit. It seems that the Ukrainian military is putting up quite the fight, putting up some stiff resistance. That's why it's so quiet in the city. Uh, and uh, Zelensky, I think, is one of the reasons for this. Uh, he has remained in the city. He has resisted uh, calls to flee. He's making videos in his office. He's sticking with his people. And I, thinking that's, I think that's helping uh, motivate uh, his forces. How long they can continue this, it's impossible to say. But the, uh, you, the performance of the Ukrainian military, I think, is a lot stronger than what people had thought uh, it might have been. Mm -hmm. And President Zelensky uh, setting quite an example for his people. All right, thanks for that. Associated Press reporter Joe Fetterman joining us once again. Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, calls the attack on Ukraine a grotesque war crime, saying what is happening is brutal thuggery, unprovoked evil and aggression. But beyond stern words for Russia, what exactly can the United Nations do about what's unfolding in Ukraine? Mercedes Stevenson interviews him on the West Block. Here's a preview. You've dealt a tremendous amount in your career with human rights. Uh, you were looking at war crimes. You were tweeting about this. Can you tell us a little bit about what your concerns are, in particular, on war crimes in Ukraine right now being committed by Russia? I saw you tweeting about thermobaric weapons, uh, concerns that those could potentially be used in the conflict. What are we seeing so far, and what are the risks here? Well, the, the, the print, the, in, 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 even in wartime, we have rules. And the key, the key rule in wartime is proportionality and avoiding any, uh, any unnecessary attacks on civilians. Uh, and, and what we're clearly seeing in Ukraine is no proportionality. We're seeing attacks on civilians. We're seeing attacks on people sleeping in their beds in their apartments. We're seeing attacks on kindergartens. Um, but overall, the overall crime is a crime of, uh, against a, a nation, first of all, uh, Mr. Putin has denied the existence of the Ukrainian nation. 
He's denied the legitimacy of a people. And it's important to remember that all every historical record of a genocide starts with words. It starts with thoughts and words. And Mr. Putin is articulating those thoughts and words. So when it, when it comes to building up a case, uh, we obviously have to be systematic in building up a case, but we need to understand just how bad what Russia is doing is. Uh, and, and we have to, it's hard sometimes to find the words and it's not about just sort of trying to be as creative in, in, in speaking adjectives as you can, but we need to understand the horror of what is being inflicted on the Ukrainian people. It, it has no justification whatsoever. And you can watch the full interview with Canada's ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, tomorrow on the West Block right here on Global. Well, Ukraine has been imploring Western countries for aid, and it looks like some help is on the way. It's coming in the form of money, but also through international pressure on Russia to end its pursuit of taking over the country. Jennifer Johnson has more from Washington. As Russia unleashes relentless attacks against Ukraine, U.S. President Joe Biden met with his national security team and made an emergency request to Congress to allocate $6.4 billion for military and humanitarian aid. The former president of Ukraine is pleading for Western allies for help. We need the anti-tech, we need anti-aircraft, uh, we just need to increase our defensive capability to stop the crazy uh, aggressor in Europe. Humanitarian aid is desperately needed too for the Ukrainians fleeing their country, mostly women and children. They moved out without nothing. Even, I'm sorry, like no socks, no toothbrush, nothing. Protests denouncing Russia's invasion of Ukraine have erupted around the world, from the White House to Tokyo. Many Russian citizens are disgusted by President Vladimir Putin's brutality. We, we hate what's just happening right now in our country. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the world hasn't seen anything like this since the Second World War. It's a generation or more since we witnessed such bloodshed in Europe. We hoped we would never have to see such sights again. Pressure is building on NATO member Turkey to close off passage of Russian warships. Ukrainians in that country fear they will never see their loved ones again. I'm calling them every 10, 15 minutes. I don't know what is happening there right now. Just stand up and do something to protect our families. 7,000 additional U.S. troops are on their way to Europe to help protect NATO allies and join NATO's response force. As concerns grow, this war could spread beyond Ukraine's borders. There's a historic nature to all this. This is the first time that the alliance has employed these high readiness forces. International pressure is mounting for Putin to end this unprovoked war. But Russian forces are continuing on their bloody mission as the death toll for both countries climbs. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Standing with Ukraine, the growing chorus of condemnation across Canada and around the world later. But first, learning to live with COVID-19, frontline workers look to a future with the virus. Alberta will remove many of its long-standing COVID-19 health measures on Tuesday, including indoor mask requirements. Premier Jason Kenney made that announcement today, saying all evidence suggests the worst of the pandemic is over. Along with losing masks, the province is removing all capacity limits on venues, getting rid of all limits on indoor and outdoor gatherings, and lifting mandatory work-from-home requirements. There is no evidence at this point that to suggest that our transition to uh, normal is negatively affecting our healthcare system. And in fact, it appears that overall transmission in the province continues to decline. Ontario is also set to remove some of its restrictions next week, including ending its use of the vaccine passport. But its indoor mask mandate will remain in place. Well, as we enter the third year of the pandemic, there is a lot of discussion about the need to permanently move on from restrictions in this country. For the new reality this week, Jeff Semple explores how that will work on the front lines of our health care system. Learning to live with COVID-19 has become something of a controversial catchphrase used by politicians, business owners and protesters who want to get rid of pandemic restrictions. 
But now, even some frontline staff here in this Toronto hospital are talking about the need to find a new way forward. We spent a few days here inside Humber River Hospital and met Dr. Leon Rivlin. He's the medical director and chief of the emergency department. Who's your surgeon? Dr. Rivlin says his most pressing concern these days isn't COVID-19 per se, but rather the fallout from two years of pandemic lockdowns. Hey there, I'm Dr. Rivlin. And staff here are seeing a significant spike in patients suffering severe mental and emotional distress. Don't give me food! We want to help you. The, the pandemic creates this general sense of anxiety. Then when you add pre-existing disease, whether it's psychosis or depression, then it only amplifies it. The question moving forward is that if there is another wave, perhaps driven by a new variant, and cases climb once again, how will we respond? We'll explore what learning to live with COVID-19 could look like, including for those who are most at risk of dying from the disease. And you can watch Jeff's full story tonight on the new reality at 8 p.m. right here on Global. Up next, stopping plastic pollution at the source, the push for United Front to tackle production. You're watching Global National. Plastic pollution will be front and center at the United Nations Environment Assembly starting next week with negotiations on a treaty to deal with the problem. As Redmond Shannon reports, the focus won't just be on waste, but on tackling plastic production as well. Around 8 billion kilos of plastic waste enter our oceans every year, but that is only about 2% of the plastic we make and consume. There is mounting evidence of how broken down microplastics affect us humans as well as wildlife. Plastic is quickly overwhelming our food systems, it's overwhelming uh, natural habitats, it is making life hell for animals, it is risking human health. This coming week, thousands of delegates meet in Nairobi, Kenya, hoping to do something about it on a global scale. The fifth United Nations Environment Assembly will also tackle issues like biodiversity and chemical pollution. But many eyes will be on plastic progress, with Canada co-facilitating those negotiations. Primary sticking points will be around this issue of legally binding, um, whether or not countries actually do commit um, to these mandatory and specific obligations and targets. The United Nations Environment Program has done a number of analyses that have shown that voluntary commitments are just not going to address the crisis in the way that we need them to. Delegate Jane Patton says the ideal outcome will be to set a mandate for governments to negotiate a binding treaty by the next meeting in two years. One that tackles plastic production and consumption as well as waste management. That's really the only way that we're going to be able to, to actually curb the harm that comes from plastics and plastic pollution. Less than a tenth of plastic waste in Canada is recycled. Most goes straight to the landfill. Earlier this month at the One Ocean Summit, Canada joined France, the US and others in a pledge to support a legally binding agreement on that full life cycle approach to plastics. And in January, more than 70 large companies that make plastics and sell their products in plastic called for something similar. I think the consumer brands that have their names on these things when they wash up on our beaches <laughs> uh, are at risk um, if they don't do something. The Canadian government says it wants to enforce a ban on six single-use plastic items like straws, cutlery and bags by the end of this year. Some municipalities have already moved ahead with similar initiatives. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Next, in the battle for public sentiment, the overwhelming show of support for Ukraine here in Canada and around the world. As Russia's siege on Ukraine continues to escalate, so too does global opposition to the Kremlin's actions. Protests opposing the Russian invasion are growing, not only in cities across Europe, but also right here at home. Mike Trolet looks at the sentiment of those taking to the streets. Hands off Ukraine! Hands off Ukraine! The voices are getting louder, angry at what Russia has done. It's more complicated for Yuri Novodvorsky. He was born in Russia, and yes, he's angry, but he organized this rally outside the Russian consulate in Montreal 
because he's embarrassed. Overcome, just full of shame and, and sorrow and horror at what Ukraine has to endure. Russia is a fascist state! The war in Ukraine is so new, it's tough to nail down what people are feeling. Whether it's in New York or Milan, the one certainty is the condemnation of Vladimir Putin's actions. But for all the anger, there's also an overriding feeling of helplessness that's bordering on despair for some expat Ukrainians in Calgary desperate for a way to connect with their homeland. Just for some comfort food. Yeah, yeah. we want to eat some cake and yeah, Try not drink to some tea, try not the to. Bad stuff. The bad stuff is almost impossible to ignore. And with each passing day, Russia is finding itself with fewer friends. Poland and Sweden are refusing to play Russia in soccer's World Cup qualifying matches, and more countries are sure to follow. Almost everyone, it seems, is on Team Ukraine. The conflict inspired Christian Boris of Toronto to create a sticker of Saint Javelin, a twist on the iconic image of Mary Magdalene, because she's holding a Javelin anti-tank weapon. The picture, now a symbol of the conflict. As a former journalist who worked in Ukraine, he hoped to raise a few dollars for charity. Only days in, he's well over $100,000. I think it's just triggered a chord around the world. I mean, we see companies pulling sponsorships. Um, they don't want to be associated with Russia anymore. Stop the war! That chord is getting louder by the day. At what point will Putin hear it? Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Sophie Louie. Tonight, we leave you with some iconic landmarks around the world lit up in blue and yellow in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Thanks for watching. I'll be back here tomorrow evening. In the meantime, have a great night.